So Phil, uh, you know, thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, we're talking Generation Terror, which is screening at the 25th uh, anniversary edition of Fright Fest. How are you feeling about the, how are you feeling about screening? Thank you, Kat, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, yeah, uh, it's my third time at Fright Fest now, so I feel I'm prepared now, finally. Third time lucky, so I'm looking forward to it as always. I feel like hopefully, now it's not my first rodeo, I might be a bit more uh, enjoyable at the Q&As and whatnot. I'm not like a rabbit in the lights as much as I have been in the past. And I think you're getting, you know, you're getting a a bit of company this year at the uh, the Q and A's, you know. And in previous years, I think it's just been, you know, yourself and Sarah. But this time, you're bringing some of the some of the the people that you spoke to along as well. Yes, indeed. So yeah, we have some people to share the spotlight with, thankfully. So we'll have some of the contributors with us. So Neil Marsh will be there. Uh, Chris Smith will be there. Ariel will be there. Amber will be there, and I think Zoe is going to be there as well. So yes, we'll let them do the talking. Nice, and obviously, as you said, you've had a you've had a couple of films that have gone through through Fright Fest, both fiction and documentary. How do you think that screening at festivals such as as Fright Fest um, help independent filmmakers? You know, what is it about screening at these festivals that that helps uh, you guys get a platform? Uh, yeah, I think it's the the recognition of the festival itself. I mean, the guys have such um, a good taste for film so it's like for buyers I guess there's that sort of seal of approval so if it's screened at Fright Fest they know there's a certain quality attached to the the film so it makes people more receptive to actually screening your movie. Nice and you know you previously made the the found footage phenomenon which you know found footage was very much around about the same time as as Generation Terror you know, Sarah also made the J Horror Virus, which again is is in that era. And now we've got Generation Terror. What do you think it was about that sort of decade or so that is so interesting in in terms of the landscape of film? For me, it's the the period where I was coming of age, if you will. So I know the golden era is the seventies and eighties, but I wasn't there for that. Mm. But for this, I very much was. And for me, it's a chance to chronicle a period that was just as tumultuous as like the 70s in terms of what was going on. And for me, genre wise, I do believe it was a, a boom in comparison to what happened in the 90s beforehand, where horror was something of a dirty word. So it's kind of for us a chance to reappraise a, a decade that hasn't got the props of the the classic golden era as yet but if you look at it there are some absolute bangers that came out of that decade and if you want to get into it academically it was just as broad and tumultuous as the Vietnam era so okay. it just seems like a good point to uh look at a decade that seems close but it's actually 20 odd years away now so it's just crazy no it's not it's still a teenager stop it <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, do you, you know, looking back at that time, you know, what were your, what were your favourites? You know, you said this was sort of like your coming of age time. You know, what were the ones that you you were watching more than others, perhaps? Uh, yeah, for me, hands down, it was the new French extremity stuff. That was that was me all day. So I was there for that movement, which was exciting as a, a horror fan, because we were getting very much new and fresh material from a place that, prior to that, I hadn't really dabbled with horror. I mean, you had mm. genre and stuff like that, but no, France and horror did not compute. They weren't really uh, aligned with one another sensibly, sensibly. So their aesthetics weren't really combined. I mean, France is high art and whatnot, and horror was a, a dirty genre, which it had been for many countries previously. But seeing what the country could do when the filmmakers were given a chance just blew my mind. Yeah. And when it comes to, you know, working out who you're going to try and interview and stuff, you know, with it being such a, a broad range of subgenres that were popular, you got your found footage, your J-horror, your French extremity. How did you sort of whittle it down to these are the people that we'd really like to, to interview? So part of it was who we knew, to be honest with you. So it does help that we've got a relationship with some of the filmmakers. And another part is they're good speakers. 
so they were filmmakers obviously we, we did try to get but they were just too busy or didn't get back to us so it's a bit of a, a thing where who do we know who's available and try and whittle down the list through that so there was no rhyme or reason it wasn't we had to get these people which is what we did have with the found footage phenomenon because we needed the holy trinity for that of Ruggiero, Oren Pelli and uh, Eduardo Sanchez but for this one because it was covering so much which is a pretty much a case of getting who we like who we know are good speakers and who was available mm. which is far less sexy I know <laughs> and when you are you know when you are interviewing them and then you're you know, looking back through through the footage how you know how did you guys feel sort of seeing you know how passionate some of these people were because I think there's this conception that directors kind of are all about themselves and would potentially just sit there and talk to you for an hour about their contribution to this movement but I don't you know from watching the documentary that's not the case you know you've got somebody like Joe Lynch who is you know talking extensively about everything I don't he doesn't even necessarily really mention his own films he's you know too busy talking about everybody else's you know how how interesting was that for you guys to suddenly see that okay you know this isn't just us you know and it's not these people wanting to talk about their contribution they want to talk about their own experiences too yeah, so that kind of followed on from found footage phenomenon because we wanted the filmmakers to discuss the genre as a whole. Mm. And so we kind of hoped we could carry that over into this, which luckily we did because horror directors for the most part are horror film fans as well. So yeah, they may not as be academically as minded, but they do have the knowledge and they do have the experience with these films. So it did help. And especially when you got someone like Joe Lynch, who is like literally an encyclopedia of horror himself. But so that was a, a big surprise for us because we knew he's a horror fan and a bit of a horror nerd like ourselves. But then when we started seeing just how in depth he could go on a, a question, he was like, okay, this guy's obsession for horror is bordering online with all the academics in this documentary. Definitely. And was there anything that anybody said that maybe made you sort of reassess or rethink any of the movement? Yes, actually, for me, it was the, the remakes part, because I was a snob, I, I'll be honest, I was like, anti-remakes, remakes up. I was that guy. But listening to um, Glenn and Jeffrey and just saying, well, if you want to work, you've got to do the remakes, because that's all the studios were making. So it added very much a human factor to it, but as a horror fan back then, I was like, oh, why aren't they making original films? I was like, well, now I know. So I think I was a bit too harsh on remakes back in the day, which is why I've learned through this documentary. Yeah, I mean, I think the remakes have, have a place because, you know, they were predominantly remaking films from the 70s and, and 80s, and, you know, not all of the, the youngsters were necessarily going to go back and find those originals. So it was kind of nice... I think I know a lot of people that sort of went to you know, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre via the, the remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because they saw that and they went, oh, yeah, that's cool. Let's see where it came from. So I, I think there is an argument for a place for, for them as a nice little gateway in. Yeah, and especially as when you look back, they were giving emerging directors a larger sort of profile. So... Alexander Ayar coming off high tension with the Hills of Ice remake and doing something that no American filmmaker probably would have done in terms of violence. They definitely have their, their worth for sure. And yeah, that's something I've learned to appreciate by this documentary. Hills taught me the perils of sleeping with headphones in uh, because I was, I was, I think I was at uni at the time and that was how I was like getting sleep at night. I put my I put my headphones on, I put my iPod on, and then I watched the Hills of Eyes remake, and I was like, nope, not anymore, because that's how you uh, get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's how you get in trouble, so I'm going to be prepared. Um, you know, having done, you know, a couple of documentaries, you know, within the horror world, obviously there's also the, the Texas Chainsaw one that you're a part of, you know, is this it for horror documentaries for you, or do you have any other ideas, any other genres that maybe you'd like to, to put a, a spotlight yeah. on? Yeah. It goes back to me being a horror nerd as well. So I'm always looking to just continue learning as I go through these documentaries. So there is a few more I'm hoping to get off the ground. I can't talk about a couple just yet, unfortunately, but I am off to Rome next week to, uh, so that should be a good indicator of where the next one could be going. But yeah, 
there's a few in the, the works, a couple of announcements coming out in the next few months, but nothing I can say just yet. But no, this is definitely not the end of my documentary days just yet. And I mean, are you, are you ever going to re-traumatise people again with, with some of your fiction? Because Cruel I'd Summer to, just yeah. lives in that, it lives in those nightmares. I'm sorry, mate. But no, I'd love to, but it's a case of um, finance people not knowing who I am, <laughs> maybe. But no, I definitely want to try to get back into the narrative game. It's just figuring out how. And, you know, Fright Fest pass holders are, you know, their tickets go on sale pretty soon. They're working out what they're going to watch. Why do you hope that they take a chance on, on Generation Terror? Well, for me, it's a, it's a chance to look back at a, an era that isn't regarded as highly as some of the, the other golden eras. But hopefully, if you do take a, a punt on Generation Terror, you'll come off the other side with a whole new uh, appreciation of a, a decade that gave us a hell of a lot of what we're seeing now. Yes, well, I wish you guys the best of luck with the screening. Uh, I know it's... <laughs> I know it's Monday, I want to say 3.30, but I don't actually know for sure. Yeah, it's, I, think it, I think it's Monday, it might be 3.15, um, okay. but yes, I wish you the, the, the best of luck with the, with the screening. Thank you, Kat, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you there.